Okay, everyone, let's start. Okay. Yeah, uh, welcome back to me and also welcome back to you. Um, I guess we could do it in German, but we are going to keep it in English because the whole lecture has been running in English and also for all the attendees who are going to rewatch this online. Um, yeah, thanks for the six of you who, who came here. I already said it's like the, the core. <laughs> Keeping up, uh, it's nice. I mean, it's understandable, you know, it's just literally just two days from, from Heiligabend and then it's Christmas time. So. Um, but yeah, it's actually good for you guys because I got some presents for everyone. I got some uh, celebration stuff, yeah. Because we're less people means more per person, right? So uh, maybe I'll just start here. Maybe just, you know, I'll just, around, but just feel free to take as much as you want, right? Like, really it is. I thought this was a group, right? Um, I would say less, expecting less, but uh, you know, like not six people. <laughs> so yeah, just take whatever you want. There's actually also two people on on the Zoom. Oh, now a seven person is okay. L less to share for you guys, but you know, it's still okay, I guess. Oh wow, look at nice. <laughs> <laughs> See. We are talking about the, the chocolate and the free stuff, right? And suddenly everyone appears, yeah? That's how Germany works, you know? As, as soon as there's free stuff, you know, people go crazy, yeah? You can also have some, yeah? So it's not just for students, it's also... We are celebrating today, yeah? Um, no, but seriously, so today we are just gonna, you know, um, take some time to reflect. Really, it's a slowdown. Uh, we have had uh, eight lectures in the past which were really content-packed. The very first lecture that we have was really just on the motivational side. So nine lectures which introduced something new along the way. But today we are just going to have some, some slowdown, some recap. It doesn't make sense uh, when we are so little and, and when, when there's, you know, the winter break around the corner that we introduce new stuff, right? So that's why we are just going to recap, right? Use our time to reflect on what we've learned. Um, yeah, so that's what I call the 10th session today, the Christmas slowdown. Yeah? But yeah, everything else is the same. We're still causality for AI and ML. But before that, um, just a quick recap as well. So as some of you know, we have been to the US. At least I've been the last two weeks. And uh, Moritz, for instance, was the, the last week. Uh, just to prove to you that we have been away. And, and what did we do? Maybe to also share this, you know, like we were not just not here because we didn't want to know. Uh, I mean, we care about this lecture. This is actually what we do in our research, right? It's just that it's new, right? And and, and so it, it's it's a bit more work. But yeah, we were visiting uh, Professor Nataraja, uh, the Starling Lab. Uh, it's at uh, University of Texas at Dallas. So in Texas, very big state. If you have not been there, everything is big and it's true. Um, and yeah, you can see here, so so two of our colleagues, this is Hikaru Shindo and this is Quentin Del Foss. Uh, they work on like neurosymbolic stuff and reinforcement learning. And that's also mostly the focus of the lab of Natarajan, but they also have some work in causality, right? And uh, then again, you know, we're good friends with this lab and we want to do, you know, some collaborations and stuff like that. So here you can see us, you know, discussing with uh, Nikhil, Ranvir and, and Sahil. So some new uh, collaboration ideas. Yeah, that's, I think, the spirit of science and research, right? Like really be open, discuss with people, exchange. You know? And as a proof, there are causality related things. So, so we went to the office of, of Professor Shiram and, he has like this very nice uh, shelf with all these amazing books. And obviously he has a section on, on causality related books. As you can see, here's Pearl's key work, right? The, the causality book. Uh, you cannot see now because of the, the color uh, um, uh, error that we have on the, on the projector, but this here is red. So this is the very first edition actually, which came out. So typically the, the, the 2009 that you get now, it's the second edition, uh, which has some additional content and comment. But then there's also, for example, this heuristics, probability, and causality. This was an homage to, to Pearl by some of his students and also collaborators like Joe Halper and Rina Dekter. And um, yeah, that was, that was that's kind of, I actually didn't even know about this book. That was interesting for me to find out. I didn't even know the sixes. Um, they did an homage just recently, actually, on all the causal stuff. So this one I knew of, but I didn't know that almost the same authors did that like, what, 20 years back. So that's crazy. Um, yeah, Bayesian networks, 
some other, you know, also, I mean, very different books he has there, but just like the causal stuff, obviously not the constraint processing. So it's like these four books. However, there was one book on uncertainty by Halpern, who did the actual causation book, which is actually quite interesting. And yeah, what we also saw some historic places. So here you can see on the picture, the US flag, obviously they have a lot of these, <laughs> and also big ones. And this is the Dili Plaza, where actually President John F. Kennedy uh, was assassinated, right? Um, yeah, historic place, uh, crazy to be at a place like this. Um, yeah, that's in downtown Dallas. Now there was just this this one week that we that well I, I was uh, separate from the others, right? And 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 just doing a research visit. But then we also, you know, that was I guess the main ordeal, right? So we went to Nurips, you know, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, machine learning conference. And yeah, it was the very first one uh, full time in person ever since COVID, right? So last year we already had hybrid. The year before, however, was completely virtual. So it's been some time, you know, people were, uh, yeah, really excited and happy. And man, it was so many people, yeah? So obviously, you know, things like COVID and these things, you know, that happens at the scale, yeah, unfortunately, but it is what it is. But yeah, we were still happy. Uh, we were good. We are presenting this, this work, do not marginalize mechanisms, rather consolidate. I don't think we are gonna, going to ever cover this here in this lecture. So if you want to check it out, I just put the archive link here if you want to talk about this. It's a work in causal abstractions, right? So last week we saw with Florian, the representation learning, by the way, nice job, Florian. Also the meme at the very end, yeah, very good. Um, but yeah, so so also these lectures, by the way, yesterday night I uploaded all of this, right? So uh, you can rewatch if you haven't, haven't seen those or if you just want to recapture on those, also the slide decks and everything is online. But yeah, this is cause abstraction, this work, which is essentially one step above in a sense of representation learning. Representation learning, we have data and we learn about the variables themselves and the graph and maybe even the SEM. But in abstractions, we really go from an SEM to another SEM. Why do we do that? Because some levels of descriptions are more suitable for certain tasks than others. And yeah, here you can just see us together with Dave, who if you, you have seen in, in the first lecture, but then he became a professor and left us, right? So <laughs> that's, that's but yeah, he's obviously a co-author here, just like Christian. Uh, yeah, this was our poster. And um, luckily, a lot of people were actually interested in our work, right? So uh, yeah, plenty of people stopping by from all the, so, so what you've seen maybe in part one is, uh, you know, all the classical causal stuff. So we didn't reference any single paper. It's just, you know, the standard literature. But now, you know, with representation learning, with fairness and all these AI, more AI and learning related topics, you're going to see a lot more, you know, citations to more recent works because it's an ongoing endeavor. So these things are non-standard and they're still very much open to discussion. They have not been around for 20, 30, 40 plus years, right? And um, yeah, and so, so, so ours is obviously part of this, right? And you have authors here, for example, Zoravit was uh, working with Jonas Peters, right? And and here's some amazing work. Uh, here's Richard Carlson. He's currently working in, in, in Boston at Harvard with uh, Miguel Anan. So yeah, it's it's really awesome to see actually these people, right? And then, you know, all these amazing works they have. And, and, and these are exactly these authors that you're going to encounter in the second part of the lecture where we really cover more recent works, right? So, so they're real people, right? They exist. Yeah. <laughs> you can attack with them. But you usually only see them in kind of you know, setting like this, which is a bit unfortunate, but that's why we also do things like online seminars and groups and stuff like that, right? Also, not everyone can travel, right? This was in New Orleans, right? So in Louisiana, also in the South, at uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Um, yeah, I mean, visa issues, getting to the US also, I mean, long flights and stuff like that. So so it's not easy, yeah? But it was, it was fun, certainly. And there's a very nice perk uh, that you get, you know, free goodies, yeah? So I think that's the main part of a conference, right? Quentin was saying like, oh, it's about the science. No, I think about, it's about the free stuff, yeah? So uh, these were some stocks from the Bosch Center for AI. Uh, very nice place. I actually did an internship once there. So uh, feel free to check it out. They obviously want you to do an internship or get a position. I just want the socks. So, <laughs> you know, like it, it can be a conflict of interest sometimes, but these are actually very nice socks, not because they were made in Baden Wittenberg, but because, you know, like they actually are, uh, they were made in Germany, yeah, and 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 I trust you know the made in Germany is still a thing, I think. Um, but yeah, there was also other things happening at Nurips, right? So they have parties going on, right? So 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 now you say, oh Mate, you just care about the free stuff, not the science, right? But I didn't care about the parties as much, right? 
we had colleagues, I'm not going to mention who, but they were at every party every single day. Yeah, They were even at two or three parties in the same evening. They even went to hot tub parties. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, um, And so, you know, there was one party organized by the people who did the LAMA, right? So LAMA, again, it stands for Large Language Model Meta AI, right? So it's this like open source large language model by, by Meta, formerly Facebook. And very nice model and awesome. And obviously, they also do a party. And again, for them, it's the interest that, you know, you get people to do an internship, get interested. But then also a lot of people there, they're just interested in the free drinks and the food and the nice venue that they can have in that moment. Yeah. I mean, totally understandable, right? The funny thing here now is, and, and that's the last thing I'm going to show for, for, for this conference recap. Um, yeah. They just brought an actual llama. I mean, just for the fucking joke of it. Yeah. I mean... Yeah, so, so I think this is something only, you know, like these Silicon Valley type computer scientists, engineers, you know, they, they would be people to get, you know, a llama from wherever they got it and bring it to New Orleans, to the south of the US, just for, for the party, right? Um, yeah, I was taking a lot of photos. Actually, one of our colleagues, Manuel, he has a photo with a llama. So if you want to know more about llama, ask Manuel. And both llamas, he knows about both llamas, so yeah. But yeah, that, that's it for, for the short recap, you know, just to share with you as well. You know, again, this is a slowdown and we are having fun and showing you that we are also real people. <laughs> we, we don't just do this and then disappear and, you know, reappear for the next session. Um, yeah, but yeah, back for, for the Kai lecture. So what are we going to do today? So today we have the Christmas overview. <laughs> it's just going to be a short rewind and an open discussion. Florian would ask me now where did I get this from? I got it for flat icon, and I would not, you know, cite the uh, original artist, so I'm fine with that. And yeah, now uh, section one, rewind. So this is just gonna be now. We are really gonna breeze through everything to just remind ourselves, you know, have really kind of like in a nutshell uh, summaries of each of the lectures, etc. I think that's a good thing to do for today's session. That's gonna be the bulk part. And then the rest we are going to use just, you know, for open discussion. So lecture one, right? This was the one that uh, Dave gave um, and was really the motivational part. Here, I just want to present one slide. So in that lecture back then, we really just wanted to motivate causality, right? And so um, the example that I personally love a lot is the one given by Peters, uh, also in their joint book with Janssen and Schurkopf, where essentially we have the situation where we have these two data sets. And obviously the samples are different, right? I mean, they are different data sets, right? They are actually also measuring different things, right? So we have a phenotype here for a certain gene, but then a pheno different phenotype for, I mean, same phenotype, but for a different gene then, right? Um, and, but the data looks very similar, right? And so you could be, as a machine learning practitioner, you could be agnostic to, to the fact that, you know, like, okay, this is measuring maybe something else or whatever, you know, just with respect to fitting functions, uh, you would do the same thing here. Yeah, you would in both cases just fit the linear linear line here. Yeah, you just do simple regression. But now the thing is, if we ask a hypothetical question of like, say, what if we kill the activity of the gene? Because that's an experiment that you know biologists can actually do, right? They can just you know shut down, uh, knock out an, a, a gene. Yeah. So it would be the question of what kind of phenotype expression. So where would the dot be or the dots? Or on this uh, vertical line here, if if we set the gene to zero in both cases, yeah. And now what we find is that in the case where the gene is actually causing the phenotype, so this is the underlying data generating process, the SEM, which generated this, uh, the graph of the SEM, which generated this data, then our linear regression is fine, right? Like you just extrapolate here, you extend the line, and you see you would land in the right range. Yeah. But the thing is. If we have the following structure, right? So there's a confounder, yeah? Um, so gene B is not actively causing the phenotype. But then in that situation, uh, well, there would not be a change, right? Like you, you just knock out gene B, but it doesn't uh, affect the phenotype expression. So you would expect something like this in the range. And now, depending on how you know critical this, 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 this uh, setup is, right? Be it you know money, be it ethical reason, be it whatever, right? Uh, you would fail miserably, right? So, so really, it would just be chance, you know, depending on this distribution, essentially, of, of how these data generating processes are um, to, you know, do the right thing with your model, right? And so what then, you know, someone like Peters would say is, you have to say, I don't know, 
really that's the only scientifically correct and sound conclusion. I don't know um, if, if, if you're willing to ignore this. But obviously, you know, we want to know, we want to do the best thing, right? So then you really have only one choice, and that is considering the causality, right? And that's really the base motivation. So as soon as we go out of distribution, as soon as we generalize, as soon as we ask how hypothetical questions, right? Which maybe just involve simple interventions, not even counterfactuals, which are super interesting themselves, yeah? Then you actually need causality. It's necessary, right? That's the big motivation here. Um, we're just going to browse through this. Of course, if you have any questions, you know, just interrupt me at any point in time. But we can always go back to the slides. Again, we are going to have the proper open discussion at, at the in the sec second half of this uh, session today. So in lecture two, we then, you know, just covered some basics, right? Like, you know, have the same language, the same idea of some key concepts that we use to ground, you know, the causal framework in. And so, you know, one of the key concepts is, of course, is always base rule. Uh, I just took base rule here now because it also stands, you know, for just, you know, in general, the, the laws of, of probability theory that we can deploy to manipulate these expressions in an algebraic manner. So, for example, if we say something like the conditional A, A given B, that's really just a joint uh, and then, you know, uh, divided by the, the marginal of, of what you have previously conditioned on. And, you know, same game, right? You can just commute it. And then in base rule, you're actually equating the two uh, conditionals in this way, right? And there's this uh, interpretation, right? That, you know, if A is our hypothesis, then B is our evidence. And, and how does our hypothesis now change, like our belief about the hypothesis being true in the light of some new evidence, say, yeah? So that's really this Bayesian framework, the Bayesian way of thinking. It really captures nicely also these, you know, probabilistic objects. Now, what is statistics? So statistics, we just defined as the inverse problem of learning about the probability space from outcomes of the experiments, right? So we are not uh, going from, uh, you know, probability space to outcomes. You know, we're not sampling or something like that. We are actually taking outcomes. We have some data and we have something that was collected by someone and now use that to reason about the actual distribution, right? So you have n data points, x, y, labeled or in, in this indexed by, by this i, and now you try to reason about this actual object, right? Obviously, you're always going to have an estimator, so it's always going to be some kind of p hat, right? But ultimately, you want to learn a p hat, like have an estimator where p hat would, you know, eventually be asymptotically correct and consistent with, say, the, the true p, right? Now, we always talk about correlations not equal to causation. So I felt like, okay, it's important to define what is actually correlation, right? Like, how can we differentiate something if you don't know what it is, right? And so correlation, we really get from the notion at least, for example, something like the Pearson correlation coefficient, which is deployed a lot of times, we just get it from the notion of covariance. What was covariance, essentially? So really, you have just two random variables, x and y, and now they just have this interaction, right, modeled by this multiplicative term. And it's an interaction between not x and y directly, but x, you know, uh, mean shifted and y mean shifted. Yeah? That's this, this covariant aspect, which is captured by this formula. And now the correlation coefficient is really just this divided by the interaction of the uh, square roots of the marginal variances, right? Marginal variance again, right? Like it's the spread of, of one certain variable that you see. Um, and then, you know, whatever that value is, you take the square root, multiply it with the other one. And that's the thing you divide, right? And then there's some uh, in more intuitive meanings. For example, if a row is zero, then we say that X and Y are uncorrelated. Huh? Um, next, super big and important topic, as you have seen also in the lectures on causal discovery, as we're going to see in a second, conditional dependence, right? Like this all relates to deseparation, to all these other graphical notions we introduce later on. But in general, conditional dependence, right? So say you have this triplet of sets of, of random variables x, y, and z, then you can say that the first two are conditionally independent, given the third, if this equality holds for all instantiations. And where further, you know, it is possible for the condition to actually happen, right? That's also an important restriction. But really, what you're saying is that, you know, you can write this joint given Z uh, simply as the factorization given Z. Uh, again, if for all the values this holds, and um, uh, you you actually can have the fact that, you know, the, the condition would ever occur, right? So, and, and this is used everywhere. And obviously, you know, this for all and, and, and you know, equality checking, this already gives you a hint why, why it's difficult to test this in, in, in practice, right? 
uh, let alone then talking about you know how big these sets can actually be, right? Then very important graphs, right? I mean, we focus mostly on the Perlian notion of causality, and so graphs are super important, right? On a computer, we represent them typically as as adjacency matrices, right? And then just visualize them, you know, as graphs. Um, but ultimately, they are graphs, so they can be depicted like this visually, where you have, you know, a graph that has uh, nodes, yeah, x, y, z, w, and edges between these nodes. And in our causal models, obviously, this will causal relations, and you know, these variables would be called uh, endogenous variables because they are caused by other variables in the system. Uh, here, for example, you would x and y you could consider to be exogenous if you just take it as face value. But we always know that we have this exogenous term in SCMs, for instance, that we are not drawing explicitly. So they are really endogenous in that sense as well. They're just not caused by any other endogenous variables within that system. And then, you know, there's these typical notions, right? Like x and y are, for example, parents of z, right? Because there's errors going in here. Uh, obviously, you can make a more formal and technical definition based, for example, on a structural equation and really define what a parent means, right? But, you know, here it's just about the notation and, and the intuition, right? Z would be a child of Y. And so, you know, we can denote these sets. We can have maybe in the sets the actual variables themselves. These would be, you know, some notational um, specific, uh, specificities, right? So, um, yeah, always have, have to watch out for that. Now, graphs, we use them a lot in this framework, especially because of this concept of deseparation. For example, here you can see these three structures from God, as Dave was putting it in the very first lecture, where he was just teasing this. But really, it's just these three special graph structures, right, defined always over these triplets X, Y, and Z, where chains and forks behave uh, the same in the deseparation sense, while a collider is different. So again, what was it? Essentially just saying that if you have a chain, then you say that X and Y, so the outer two ones, are deseparated given Z, um, only in the case where you actually you know, observe Z, right? Um, and that's very in line also then with obviously, you know, given faithfulness and these things, but this is in line with what we have with the conditional independence, because what we are saying is that, say here, for example, Z, Z is being caused by X, it's, essentially contains the information from X and especially all the information which ultimately will be necessary for Y. So if I have Z, then I don't need any more X to, you know, know something about Y because Z already has all the information necessary. So it wouldn't change my belief, right? And that's how all of these things eventually connect. Then a final maybe remark on, on what I think was also important to note in lecture two, uh, just the super exponential growth. Right, so if you look at the number of possible DAGs, so the directed acyclic graphs, uh, with respect to the number of nodes of the graph, right? So we just add new nodes, right? Then you can see this gets out of hand very quickly, right? Like we have just five nodes and the number of possible graphs is almost 30,000, right? Like unbelievable number. And the funny thing about this special, uh, you know, like visualization or, or schematic, is, is that the length of the number grows actually faster than any linear term even, right? So that's a different statistic, but it's, a, it's just a funny thing that, you know, someone noticed. Yeah. So that was essentially lecture two. Now lecture three, what did we do in lecture three? So in lecture three, we, for the first time, really kicked off with Perl's framework, right? And discussed, you know, causality. And so we presented Perl's solution. This was really what we did in the just, you know, before actually explaining any of those specifically, that was just the overview. Now that you have actually learned about all these things, I think uh, you can appreciate the slide even more. This is, I think, a very compact summary, right? Like how does Perl represent reality, right? The thing that generates our data, that's the structural causal model. And what kind of data does the structural causal model define? What kind of data does reality consist of? He's saying there's three levels factual information, hypothetical, and retrospective, right? And these three form a ladder, right? So interventions cannot be determined by just factual information, and counterfactuals cannot, cannot be determined by only uh, interventional information. And all this thing we summarize as the Perl causal hierarchy. Now, we then in this lecture looked at how to actually formalize this. How do we do evaluation if we had an SCM, right? Typically, we don't have this, right? But Maybe we have an approximation, but like, even if you have an approximation, like how do we actually generate this type of data? And so that's what we have here with this evaluation scheme. 
here for L1, so just observational data. Say we had this SCM M, and now this joint probability PV uh, for such that uh, is defined such that for every subset of V, right, could also be the whole set V, we have uh, the probability of Y then defined as this, right? So one instantiation of the set of random variables Y, which is a subset of V. And what is it? It's really just looking at all of the cases where you would get this solution that you want. So Y being equal to Y, but you look at the use, the, the exogenous terms. So all the use which can generate if you run your SEM, because if you have a U, then your solution to the SEM, at least the ones that we look at, is uh, uniquely defined. And now you just look at all the uh, U's which have your Y exactly like you requested, and then just multiply it by the probability of that certain U. And now sum up over all those U's. So essentially, very intuitively, it's all the words, right? Like a U is like a word, right? Like a specific instantiation of the word. And essentially, the probability of any kind of event is just all the possible, the, the probabilities of all the possible words summed together where this reality could happen. Uh, that's really it. And what's really nice about this formulation is eventually we'll see that we can actually um, reuse this formulation and just extend it a little bit, a little bit uh, in a very minimal way to make everything very consistent and unified. But before we can do that, we need a very important concept, right? Maybe one of the key concepts. So philosophically speaking, Pearl's framework is interventionist, right? So we change things, we observe change, or maybe we don't observe, but in principle, there is some change, and that's what makes it causal. And we can manipulate these SCMs. And how do we do that? So typically, you know, our SCM, again, exogenous, endogenous, structural equation, and, and joint distribution over the exogenous. So that's how we specify it. And now if we intervene on it, say we want to set a certain set of variables x to some particular realization, little x, then we can just denote it like this and replace the previous structural equations by the regular ones, um, just taking out the equation for x and replacing it by the new equation, which just puts x to x. Right? This would be a hard intervention, as we call them. Now, if you have to find this uh, simple um, uh, method, then you can have this word formulation, which now is already for counterfactuals, right? So you again have like these, these you know, uh, interventional counterfactuals here. So you have like, uh, what would be the value of Y given I put X to X and so on, and Z given I put W to W. Um, and if you have multiple of these words, right? It's the same formula you're, you're doing, right? You're just checking now for these um, different counterfactual words, but now you have the whole hierarchy in here. Yeah? And now if you just want to jump back to interventions, you just kick out all the dots and the Z, right? You just keep Y, X, for instance, right? So if you just consider a single world where you look at what would have been the value of Y had X been X, that will be the intervention. But if you allow for multiple, you already have counterfactuals, right? And so that's why it's nice to see if you compare this to the previous formula, we have just extended this and allowed for the subscript, right? But it entails already interventions and counterfactuals. Again, because interventions are necessary for counterfactuals. You, you use interventions, plus some knowledge on, on the units, right, to, to get counterfactuals. And finally, I think the important part of that lecture was to recognize the fundamental result. Less important for us, I guess, in practice, right? This is more like a justification for why causality works and a, a sound one at that, but it's still a very fundamental and, 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 and also nice to show result. Uh, ignoring maybe the Lebesgue measure and now, you know, the encoding of the equivalence class and what PCH collapse now ex exactly means and so on. But what this result really tells you is that without any assumptions on the structure, structure of your graph or any assumptions on the parametrics of your structural equations, you will never be able to go from just, you know, your L1 to L2 or from your L2 to L3 or even worse from L1 to L3, right? So there's these boundaries and they are sharp and you cannot jump. Yeah, you cannot do these interlayer inferences. Yeah. If you don't make any assumptions. Of course, you know, you can just draw a graph and say, okay, it must be like this, and this is sound. This is Pearl's framework, right? But now then someone would come and say, hey, does this graph even make sense? Right. That's why you have to be cautious. But really, this is telling us, yeah, you cannot infer one from the other. So these concepts actually are separated and they make sense to talk about, right? And so, so that's the important part here. Now, 
we then moved to lecture four, and this was the lecture which was given to you by, yeah? Yes, first. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Um, I don't remember whether Elias, so this is taken from the way Elias Barenboim defines it with his collaborators, right? Um, I'm not sure whether they discuss the continuous case. Naturally, right, when you have sums, then typically you just replace it with the integral and, and you're good to go. Um, I think this should also be exactly the case here. I, I don't think there were any problems with that. And I think they also just comment that. Uh, but we ha would have to go back, right, and see. You know, obviously, not always the trick works of just going to continuous and it working, right, for whatever reason, right, be it, you know, your attractability of inference or anything, yeah? Uh, we would have to check. We can maybe do after the lecture. Um, but as far as I remember, there's, there's no issue of, of looking at um, uh, integrals here. It's really just that you want to have the, the definition on a conceptual level presented in a very simple manner. So that's why that's the only reason why we choose uh, to present uh, the discrete. Yeah. Um, again, also for the simple manner, because uh, you remember maybe from exactly that lecture as well, we had these nice tables where you can just look at you know these different u values and everything. It makes it just very tidy and and, and clean to look at. Um, but yeah, let's check that after the lecture. Um, yeah, then lecture four, as I said, Jonas, uh, Jonas Seng, our colleague, was giving the lecture on causal discovery. So um, why causal discovery? Well, you might remember also this example, which is also one of my favorites. So what you see here on the x-axis is the chocolate consumption in a given country by some kind of measurements, kilograms per year per capita. And then on y-axis, you have the number of Nobel level laureates, again, in some kind of measurement scale. But in these measurement scales now, what you observe is a very nice correlation, a strong correlation. You can see that, for example, a country like Switzerland, a lot of chocolate, a lot of Nobel laureates, a country like China, uh, yeah, less, and especially given the size of the country, so it falls back. And um, yeah, we, we would be tempted to think now, somehow I, I need to, you know, boost my chocolate consumption to get, you know, more Nobel laureates. Nice, right? But of course not, right? I mean, that's the case where correlation is not causation. There is... Reichenbach's common cause principle, there is a third variable which is causing both. And here we could imagine it to be something like, you know, the GDP, right? Or in general, some kind of measure of wealth of the country per same, you know, unit. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's really what we are seeing here, right? So we could, you know, hypothesize if, if this was any other example where we would not have any, you know, say common sense presumption, right? Then this would not be clear at all, right? Like, say you didn't know much about chocolates and Nobel laureates and stuff like that, and you would have to assume that it could be this as well, right? But then again, it could also be this, right? Which in our case, we strongly believe that this is true, right? But can we also just dictate, you know, like can we even prove our point, even if we have, say, common, common sense kind of uh, lean towards this kind of graph, right? So, so that's why you want to cause discovery, like find out the actual cause of the relations. In a sense, it's a very fundamental problem. It's pretty much scientific discovery itself, right? Like we're trying to figure out how the world works, right? Especially in physics, say, yeah? So, so, so that's how you can see causal discovery. And it's separate from causal inference, right? Where we, you know, take this for granted and just care about how we actually reason, right? Like how do we come to sound conclusions? Some people would even argue that that is actually causality and this is obviously the prerequisite and what is needed and it's maybe ultimately more important, but the other thing is really about the reasoning aspect. Yeah? But then again, we can discuss this. Ultimately, we need both. We need to have the graph and it should be justified to be the correct graph. And we, we need to be able to reason based on a graph. Um, then, you know, one thing which Yuna showed you, this very important concept of the Markov equivalence class, right? So it's essentially a, a set of graph structures which you cannot further differentiate, right? This is kind of the bottleneck of especially these classic constraint-based methods where, you know, you still place assumptions like faithfulness and so on and so forth to, to you know, get down to, to, to the graph, but you are still going to end up with a Markov equivalence class. So you still won't know whether, you know, X1, for example, is causing now X3 or whether it's the other way around. And this can be super important, right? Uh, say this is a medical ex uh, um, application. So... 
obviously, you know, causality is, you know, especially because of these things, it's very difficult and we cannot get anything for free. Yeah? You can make further assumptions as we uh, maybe also discussed during the lecture. I'm not sure right now, but for example, things like the typing assumption, right? Where you can narrow this down, but then again, you make more assumptions, right? That's the game. How many assumptions can I make? How much can I relax them such that I get maximum gain, right? Like where are the limitations and so on? We have some impossibility results for, for example, the bivariate case. I mean, we know if you don't make any assumptions, it's just impossible, right? So you have to have some kind of assumptions, unfortunately, unfortunately for us, yes. Um, and as you can see, for example, here, the, the, the forks and the chains, they all end up in one class. The collider, who also behaves differently in the deseparation and independence sense, is uh, also because of that, you know, separate in a, in a separate Markov equivalence class. Now, you might say, hey, I mean, you know, these are just four graphs, yeah? Let me just check those, right? Like, I just take separate ones and see what works best for me. Sure, this brute force approach might work for, you know, these, these small, small graphs, but remember the super exponential growth, right? Like, even just with five nodes, I just add two little more nodes here, we have 30,000 uh, possible DAGs, and the Markov equivalence class is also growing, right? It's not going to be 30,000, but it's going to be a lot more than just the four here. Huh? So you're going to soon realize, I mean, typically we care about uh, hundreds, maybe even thousands and millions of variables, right? Like, depending, obviously, if you're a company like Facebook, you might care about social networks, so it's going to be in the millions. If you're maybe in a medical, you just might care about, I don't know, 20 or so, but still, even 20 can be very difficult, right? Now, one classical algorithm is this uh, Peter Clark algorithm, right? For constraint that cause discovery. I'm not going to go over this, but you know, we're just showing the algorithm again here, right? So as input, you know, you have your condition independence tester. This is the, the oracle that you have to use. But then as output, you get really the skeleton G, right? This this Mark Cullen's class descriptions, essentially. Um, and how do we do it? Well, we go over this graph. We, we check for, you know, these independencies. And, and and then, uh, yeah, can es essentially orient edges. And at some point, then we can orient even further because of constraints that the graph now has and so on. So just to play play this now uh, here, uh, you know, if we had, for example, these four, uh, these five variables, then, you know, at, at first we would have to assume that everything is connected with everything, right? And that we don't know the relation, right? But now you play the game, you can remove, for example, these outer edges. Now you can remove some more edges because of the algorithm, right? And finally, you, you might be able to orient certain directions because, you know, otherwise you would end up with colliders, which would conflict and stuff like that, right? So that's really how this, this game works. And now maybe as a final interesting thing, uh, maybe from cause discovery. So there's, you know, score-based methods. There's, you know, the recent stride and continuous optimization approaches. But then there's this very interesting approach of placing functional assumptions. So what you're saying is, uh, I don't know my SCM, but what I know about my SCM is say that it has a non-Gaussian noise, right? Or it has uh, uh, additive structural equations, right? And in these cases, you can actually even resolve the difficult bivariate case. Yeah? Again, it's funny how typically, you know, the bivariate thing is easy and then the multivariate is hard, right? Because of scale and interaction effects. But for causality, it's the exact opposite, right? Because, because of these interaction effects, you find signal. And so you can differentiate causes. But for the bivariate, there's just no way of telling whether it's the one or the other. But if you now make these kinds of assumptions, right, on the noise, where you might see something like, if you check now the direction x to y, then you see, you know, the noise here, the residuals are independent, but now you do y to x, you see there is a dependence. So for any le level of y, I would see a different support for this residual. You can conclude that one is the true direction and the other is not, right? And uh, yeah, these are actually amazing results and the, uh, the more recent class of, of cause discovery approaches. Now, that was discovery. That was about learning from data the actual graph, the structure, not the variables themselves. The variables were given, just the, the graph, right? And now in lecture five, what we did was look at identification, right? So this is the whole other strand, the, the thing about reasoning. And... First, we need, to we need to define the concept of identification. What does it mean to identify, say, a causal effect, right? A causal effect we itself defined, right? It was just this, this quantity here, for example, this interventional distribution, that's a causal effect. It's the causal effect of X on Y. And we say that it's identifiable, right? So we can get it essentially um, if for any pair of SEMs, right? which do agree on observational distribution and which share the same graph, 
this equality also holds. That's what it means to be identifiable, right? Again, identifiable just means that there will be some way of actually getting the causal effect, right? And if, you know, models which agree on this and this, but don't agree on this, then obviously, you know, you cannot identify the causal effect. You would either get this one or that one, right? And so that was just the definition for the, for the identification. And what is the big picture again? This is maybe one of the most important slides. It's really saying that you have these three as inputs, right? So you have your query, the question you're asking. So what is my causal effect? If I take an aspirin, will my headache go away? That's the question you're asking. You have some data. You don't have, obviously, the experimental data. You don't have data on people taking aspirin or not, right? You, you, have, you have data on whether they might have gotten an aspirin, right, but not in the case where they were actually forced to do so, as in a randomized control trial. And you might have some extra data, say, for example, M here. M could be, I don't know, so, so some statistic you measured uh, in between now your, your treatment and, 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 your, and your outcome, yeah? And then you have causal constraints, right? This is where the magic happens, essentially. You have some assumptions in the graph. And, you know, this could come from the previous step of just learning. This could come from your doctor, whatever, right? But really, these things are, you are doing. So you're saying, I have my data. Write my query now in terms of data using the assumptions in the graph. That's it. That's what this inference engine does. And if it's identifiable, for example, for Markovian SCM, we know every effect is identifiable, then the answer is yes. And typically, the inference engine should not just say yes, but it should also give you the formula, ideally. And so now what you can see here on the left-hand side, we have a causal quantity. It contains the do. Yeah. On the right-hand side, we have a purely statistical one. No do's, right? It's a bit more complicated. We have these two sums, this reweighing and stuff like that, but it's all in terms of available distribution. If we have this distribution, right, then you know we can get the conditional. We just you know divide by by whatever we need. We remember base rules and stuff like that, and we can get it. Of course, even the data is going to be imperfect, right? Because we're always going to have a sample. We are never going to have the actual distribution. So there's a lot of room for some errors, right? But in principle, theory tells us this is going to be the exact thing, right? And then one more thing we actually discussed in, in the session was things like, you know, adjustment sets, backdoor, front or whatever. And here we just have an example of rule one of the do calculus. If you remember, do calculus, it's this algebraic graphical tool. So we have, you know, algebraic rules and manipulations, which use graph assumptions. And rule one was, for example, invariance to observation. So what we are saying is if you have this covariate X here, you can just ignore it and kick it out, or you can reintroduce this if this... Uh, uh, independence or separation is actually holding in the in the, in the graph. Yeah? And here we were just depicting it. We're not going to go over this. I mean, you know, it's, it's really a little bit of a hassle to play this through, right? Um, but it's sound, right? It was proven sound and complete. And, and that's what we care about ultimately. So anything which is identifiable, do calculus can get it. Whether you can reach that solution, right? That's up to you. Obviously, we have algorithms which can do that. Yeah, But if you were to do it by hand, for instance, uh, but it can get everything. And then there was this final part that we had in that lecture. It was quite dense, this lecture. Uh, also, I remember this was where we had the discussions with Christian, and then we resolved it in the, the post-edit. But it was just some partial identification, right, saying that, okay, we take less assumptions, we get less out, but we get still something out which we care most about. Say, we don't want to know exactly how an aspirin is going to cure a headache, just whether it's going to do it or not, right? And so you can answer these questions, you can formulate quantities like the average treatment effect in terms of these uh, response uh, function variables and then have an optimization problem in terms of linear programs and just optimize it, yeah? And again, linear programs, yeah, that sounds like a different complexity class, but no, we have like, because of the how these uh, RFVs are defined, we have exponential blow up, right? So we don't jump in complexity there. It's just, we can make less assumptions, get less out, but that's less out is my, maybe still the most important thing we care about. Then lecture six, there's really just one slide to summarize this one because this was the coding tutorial. I hope you had fun for everyone who was attending, but really we were just going through five different exercises. We had Simpsons paradox, we had adjustment sets, we had estimation with machine learning, you know, we had like this little CNN, which was, you know, looking at these images and predicting whether, you know, the, the animal on that image was, you know, administered some medication or not. And then our model discovered that it has something to do with dogs and cats. So this disease that they were getting treated for, 
uh, was something where only dogs should be getting the treatment, right? Things like that, right? And, you know, we had some storyline surrounding it. We had text, we had the formulas, we had the code. Um, and really, oftentimes, it was really just very, very simple. For example, if you look just at this conditional difference, I mean, what is it, right? Like, we are just looking at our data frame, looking at every case where A is 1, and then just taking the mean. I mean, it's just this simple line, right? And then you divide it by this other case where A is 0, right? This is the AT. This is this expression, which maybe looks intimidating at first, right? And then we just to print it, right? And we just say what it is, right? And here we just did some visualizations, right? Oftentimes, the, the actual maths code is, is, is a lot less work than, you know, just getting it somehow on display. Yeah? But I, that was the thing that we did in, in lecture six. Then in lecture seven, we essentially concluded the uh, first part, which was again on you know classical causality with an emphasis on Perl. But because we had this big emphasis on Perl and we wanna teach you on a broad scale, give you the bigger picture, understand that there's different schools of thoughts, we jumped to other frameworks as well. For example, Neyman Rubin, they have this famous potential outcome framework. Notation-wise, it looks very similar to the, to the counterfactuals that we've seen you know, uh, from, from Perl side of things, yeah? But really, I mean, it is very similar and, and it, it has the non-graphical interpretation. Uh, what's good here is that you can really nicely formulate all of your assumptions, right? Like we discussed all these different assumptions like, such as like, you know, consistency, uh, no, for example, consistency, meaning that, you know, like whatever Y I observe in the end, it's gonna be consistent with one of the potential outcomes, no interference, right? That for any individual, it's not gonna affect any of the other individuals and things like that, right? And here you just see it was it's very grounded in the medical framework. Uh, for example, people like Miguel Hernan and so on. I think Miguel is actually also a medical doctor, not just you know. So, and um, yeah, here you have you know for example treatment, and then you know the outcome whether someone recovered or not, and then the Y one would denote like uh, what is the outcome if the person was forced to take the treatment, right? And obviously there's going to be you know these question marks because this is the fundamental problem of causal inference, right? Like that we can never observe both situations. You cannot go back in time, right? Like doing it afterwards and not taking the treatment is not the same anymore because you're not the same person anymore. So what, we, what did we look at as well? We also looked at time series, right? Everyone has kind of this impression that, you know, causality is something which is very tightly related to time, right? Like, I don't know, I kick a ball, but, you know, time passes until, you know, the ball moves along the field, yeah? But we typically talk about this abstraction, right? We just talk about causes in the sense of, if I change this one, this other thing changes, right? But naturally we can just define it with time indices and we just duplicate these variables, right? They're just, you know, different instantiations of the, the same architecture of the same template. And then, you know, there could be instantiation effects within the same time step, there's different delays and so on and so forth. And then, you know, this typically would call the full-time graph, whereas the S graph, the summary graph, would be something like this, for instance, where you just have the three variables abstracted away the time. And as you can see, X is always affecting uh, X2 and X1 is always affecting X3, but nothing else. And so that will be the summary here. Very nice simplification. Um, and depending on what you have to use, you might opt for one mode of representation. Now in time, we should also never forget Granger causality. As we told you, that's really far away from any notion of causality be it Neyman, Rubin, Pearl, or whatever. Um, still, there's very practical value to this. We are just checking essentially for this dependence here. And the intuition is that X influences Y whenever the past values of X help in predicting Y from its own past, right? So condition on the fact that you know the past of Y, so you take out that information, how much does X still give you as a gain for Y, right? And if there is a gain, you say there's a Granger cause. And again, Granger, calls him, Granger himself, you know, said it's more like forecasting, right? But it, historically, it still has this name of causality. And then finally, in that lecture, we also discussed a little bit of actual causation, right? The, the ideas which Pearl and Halpern, you know, pioneered, and then Halpern took even further and wrote a book about. Just maybe remember this thing, right? We were looking at these uh, balls, which were moving through this space, trying to get through the goal. And now you have, for example, B interacting with A at some point. And now the question, did B, you know, hitting A cause A go into the goal? And here everyone was in the room, or mostly everyone was saying, yes, it did cause go going through the goal because we can see what the counterfactual trajectory would have been. 
A would have just crashed into this barrier and not reached the goal, but because B was hitting it, it actually, you know, deflected from its original trajectory and, 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 and reached the goal, right? So, um, yeah, and, and actual causation is really a philosophical, um, a formal philosophical approach to studying exactly these kind of things, right? Trying to define in a way that we capture intuitively our examples that we care about. Then in lecture eight, this was the lecture from two weeks ago. So this was the one which uh, Moritz was giving, where we looked at the first topic, which is very hot currently also in you know AI machine learning, which is that of fairness, right? So if you look at, for example, all these diffusion models, language models, large scale models, amazing feats, right? But there's biases, right? I mean, these things are trained on our data and we have these biases. They're just gonna make it worse, right? So here we just say, generate a photo of a firefighter. Yeah? And it's very clear to see that stable diffusion is generating a very stereotypical firefighter. It's all, I guess, white Caucasian. Yeah? Whereas you go with this new approach of fair diffusion, you have an Asian guy and a black person. You also have a female person. I mean, all of these are male as well, right? So, you know, as, as also Moritz was putting it, as long as they identify, or maybe, I mean, biologically speaking or whatever that is, I don't want to go in that discussion, right? But you have to be very dangerous, uh, very careful, especially, you know, because these are very sensitive topic and it's super important, you know, to handle this with care. Um, so not just be aware of it, but, you know, discuss it in, in, in a proper language, right? So, um, yeah, super hot topic. And uh, yeah. Models, models have these biases and that's clear as day. And well, how do we resolve this? And you know, there's different notions of algorithmic fairness. So really having a data-driven, uh, uh, a methodological way of evaluating whether something isn't fair or not. So there's these different notions studied in philosophy, social science, and so on, right? Um, but then we also realize that, for example, something like upon receiving his rejection letter from the university, Tom asked himself, would I have been accepted had I been a female? You know, maybe thinking to himself that, you know, oh, currently everyone, you know, like uh, there's this uh, drive for, you know, equalization and stuff like that and so on. And, but I'm actually still good. And would I have gotten it if I was a female, right? Like I might not be able to change my gender because of whatever reason, but like would have that been enough for me to, to make it, right? And we clearly recognize, would I have been? That's a classical counterfactual question, right? So that's where people stepped in and said, hey, this causality thing, it's cool. We can use it for fairness. And then we can deploy it in our machine learning models and make machine learning more fair. And this is what we care about, right? And then, for example, one of these notions is exactly this, what was presented at NeurIPS back a couple of years now, uh, counterfactual fairness, right? Where you have these protected attributes, these A's, right? And you, you set them, right? You intervene on them. So that gives you the causal notion. Um, and you want to have, for example, this equality then, right? That, you know, Given that you know a certain attribute, uh, certain covariates, what is the, what is the probability now of 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 the outcome? Say that you actually get accepted to the university that you apply to if you change the attribute now, right? And across all these changes, ideally it should be the same, right? And so that's what gives you the fairness. Yeah. Now the last lecture, we have the guy sitting right in front here who gave that lecture. So that was the representation learning one. Representation learning, arguably one of the hottest. I mean, it's it's. I, I think it's difficult to compare. You know, saying maybe whether fairness or representation learning is bigger or not. I think in both strands we have tremendous works and a lot of work happening right now. Um, I think in in the fairness we have a lot more, at least you know, coming also from other sciences. Uh, CRL seems a lot more focused on on people you know from from math, physics, and computer science. Um, but yeah, what did we do in representation learning? I mean, here we have this nice uh, motivation, right? That, for example, we have, you know, data sets where, you know, now you see a camel not in the typical environment of sand dunes, right, on grass. And on the other hand, the cow, not on the typical environment of grass, but in a sand dune, right? But that doesn't change the fact that this is, you know, a, a cow and not a camel, obviously, and, and, and vice, or analog, analogously for, 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 for the camel, right? And so, you know, as soon as we, jump out of the typical distribution, right? We have some kind of shifts. We have some kind of shift in semantics. Our models fail, right? And, and fail for the exact reasons that we have seen in the very beginning. We were talking about the activity of a gene and phenotype, right? But this is just a different representation. This is now classification. What is on the picture? And the representation is just the picture, super high dimensional, right? Pixels and color values and stuff like that. Yeah? But the, the, the thing has not changed. And this, it's clear as day that, you know, causality 
uh, is the answer here, right? Um, whether we can get it to work is a different thing, right? But it is the answer, right? Um, yeah, and so, you know, Florian was discussing some of these basics. I like this slide a lot, so I put it here. It really gives you a nice overview. So causal inference, you know the graph, you know the variables, obviously. Um, you might even know the SCM or parts of the SCM, and now you just do reasoning, right? You're interested in actual effects and stuff like that. Causal structure learning on the other hand side, as the name suggests, you're trying to learn the structure. So you're aware of the variables, you know what should be part of your graph, but you don't know the links. So you're not now trying to learn those. But in causal representation learning, you're going even a step further. You're saying, you know, I have this highly unstructured data. I don't even collect my variables directly as such. I want to learn about these variables themselves, right? And this could come in very different guises. So I, I like also this example from uh, Johan's paper, who we also met uh, just yeah, last week at NeurIPS. Uh, it was nice to see them. Uh, they are in, 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 in uh, Amsterdam. And uh, here we have this uh, latent causal model, right? And, you know, nice results as put here on synthetic data sets, but more involved one, obviously. So they have this robot arm and this robot arm, depending on with what kind of, you know, circle, there's a blue, red, and green one it's interacting, it's going to, you know, cause some lights or not. And here we have the, the actual causal graph and, you know, this thing can be learned, right? We can actually identify those, yeah? So, so we just have, say, for example, the, the images. I'm not sure whether they just use the images or whatever, but like, let's say we just use the images as representation, right? And well, that's just an image. That's just a bunch of pixels, right? But what we extract now is these variables, that there's these different variables that we call blue light, red light, green light. But then additionally also that, say, if the robot arm touches the blue light, also, the red light might get on or something. Huh? So that's really what you're doing. Here. So you're doing a lot in the same way end to end, and that's incredible. And actually, also last week in Neurips, there was a workshop specifically on causal representation learning with amazing, promising works. But then again, we they also had a panel they were discussing for yeah almost an hour, and um, the panel also drifted a little bit to LLMs and stuff like that, which was less related. But going back to the CRL part, you could tell that you know. People care super much, but they're unhappy because, okay, like, how do we actually get these variables? Like, how can we relax assumptions? Are our assumptions even, you know, worthwhile? What about benchmarks? So there's many difficulties, right? So if you want to have a job in the next years, you know, I guess contributing to that field is, is certainly a way to go. Uh, I feel like it's safe, right? Even if it's evolving and, and moving very fast, it's still, you know, maybe the only thing which might change which is for the better is something that Francesco Locatello was discussing that essentially we are always just making assumptions to then identify something and, and have that in a paper and then we are done for the, the for the sake of publishing it's still results right but results that ultimately we will not care about because the assumptions we make never would hold right um, just because we want to have an identifiability result right but this I, I I agree with this we have to move away from this we need to have assumptions which are realistic ideally maybe testable right um to, to make some progress and yeah finally lecture 10 today's lecture so so what did we do today yeah well we did a quick recap of lectures one to nine so that's meta yeah and yeah with this i guess we did a quick quick tour and we would have like yeah starting from now we have still like 40 minutes uh obviously we don't have to to tax the 40 minutes but we can also do 50 minutes i don't care whatever you want but yeah, I would say let's do now an open discussion. We have seen everything. We can go back in these slides. Um, and yeah, as we had also in a previous session, the word map reminder, the stage is yours. You can have the chocolates, right? Are they empty already? No, no, so if anyone wants to grab, anyone needs some extra sugar. I, I, I brought some extra stuff here. We have more, like we have more if anyone needs it. You want? Yeah, always play it safe, yeah? <laughs> so yeah, let's just talk. Anyone and whatever, like, not just questions, right? I don't want this to be like, oh, now I'm the advisor and, and you're like in an inferior position. No, like, we are just level-headed now. We are discussing our thoughts and anything. Okay, let's start. Yeah, I want to go into detail about how they so the cause representation learning thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. So today, 
Florian, do you know this? What Johan did here in this paper? Okay, maybe uh, Florian can just look it up in the meanwhile and, and figure out, and then we'll get back to this point, right? Um, typically, what I know, I mean, I've also worked in disentanglement at least, right? And then used it for reinforcement learning, strongly related to these things because they use similar methods, right? For example, in disentanglement, you would be caring about things like, you know, say recognizing that this is a shape, but then it also has a color, and these are independent, right? They are independent factors of variation in our data. And then say you have a robot who's you know, trying to move objects, right? Obviously, the policy of the robot when moving an object should not depend on the color of object, right? But if you have an entangled representation, yeah, then you know you jump out of distribution, you might see a color you have not seen before. Your robot arm will be like, oh, what is this here? <laughs> um, but if you have a disentangled representation, the policy just learns to use the shape, say it knows it's, 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 a, it's a sphere, yeah, but it doesn't care about the color. So now it sees uh, the, the, the pink color, for instance, right? But it doesn't matter. It can still push the object, right? So it could generalize. So I did some of these stuff uh, back you know, also when I was doing my master's. And um, there they use variational autoencoders, right? And I think that's still the standard. They have like special models like beta VAs and so on, which enforce some kind of structure in the latent space, yeah, in the distribution. And what I would expect is that here in this setting, they just use the the, the images and train uh, bigger uh, VAEs to you know like uh, reconstruct these images, right? Uh, where they have this kind of uh, yeah latent disentanglement, and then maybe because here I mean they introduce this latent causal model, so I guess they they actually also learn somehow the, the structural equations directly or whatever, right? And um, so, so what they here need is not even the, uh, they don't care about policies or reinforcement learning here, right? So they don't care about controlling the arm, right? The arm, they are just saying what will happen if, you know, say the arm was moved here or not, right? Like, so it's uh, a visual kind of thing, right? It's not an acting thing, yeah? Um, so I would just guess they use the images, no segmentation, right? Just the raw pixels and, and train some VA models. But yeah. Yeah, they they seem to use just encoders, and it's most probably going to be just some variation of automatic. Yeah, but I'm just pretty sure no segmentation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was just written data. Otherwise, they would say something about segmentation. Maybe you could use segmentation for certain tricks, but then again. So let's think about it for a second. If you were to segment this, how would you do it? What what were you thinking, maybe? Okay, but if you do that, say say we we extract say the robot arm, the shapes, and everything. What you're doing then is you are solving the causal variables definition part via the segmentation, and now you would not do representation learning anymore. You would just do causal discovery now on your segmentation. And this could be approach, right? It would just not be cause representation learning anymore because what you do is you use segmentation to learn these variables, right? This is what you would do in this essence, yeah? Now, I'll go, go back to the word map so that we just have everything always on, on, on one, one, one thing, yeah? Yes. But just speak up, please. Don't don't even like put your arms up. Just just speak, right? Like <laughs> it's like yeah. Probability, so more probability based approach for the evolution of our state. So basically, we have in our world we have different elements uh, that represent like concepts or things that we're trying to model, and we use our probability distribution as an evolution mechanism. Or the transport or in, uh, transport of influence or information from one one element to the next. Um, can we go ahead and try to replace this very moldable, uh, very unpassable uh, uh, space? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, representation of probability that can kind of capture everything if we like massage the data and the numbers here. Um, to something that uh, to conclusion based of properties. 
So maybe this is not ideal, but I uh, see the representation of, for example, the double slit slit experiments below. Uh -huh. And if we, for example, if we what what we wanted to do is predict the shape of this interference pattern on our screen only given the um, the apparatus like the setup. So we have like our coil with the double slit, the screen, and the coherent light on the left. Um, that's our setup, and we have the necessary principles to reach the conclusion of the double slit experiment. So, for example, Huygens' principle that every point of a wave can be seen as its own, as an in detail itself, um, that the electromagnetic field is linear, and I think that should already be enough. Um, so, right now, what we would do is we would measure our setup. And derive an empirical probability distribution for the um, brightness of our light on our screen, given, for example, our experiment. However, if we had wish to use this real world knowledge of these two principles, we should be able to derive the exact same thing, well, plus some geometry. Um, so, can we have a system where we have these universal rules and we just say, okay, this is the setup, and now we have these rules, we get our conclusion. With skipping probability. So, um, using applying our rules to our setup to perform the same evolution of our state, of our information. Okay, so uh, <laughs> there's a lot happening here. Uh, amazing that you have, you know, this intuition and this these thoughts and this, this spirit of adventure. I think that's key for any scientist. Um, let's dissect a little bit more, right? So, obviously, we're just talking on a high level now. But that's why I also want to clear some maybe other aspects. So first of all, is it possible to just have a causal framework without probabilities? Absolutely. I mean, even Perl's framework, you can just ignore the, the stochasticity and you already have no probabilities anymore. So even Perl's framework works. Then again, you were not just talking about skipping probabilities. You were talking about properties and stuff like that. Yes, that's also possible. You can just define causality absolutely in a, in a different kind of way, right? For example, one recent work which did this is by Michel Delara and uh, Benjamin Eman. They actually also presented in this one discussion group online, which I'm running, uh, but also at some other workshops earlier this year. They based their work on something known as the Witzenhausen model, which is like a decision-making framework. So you have agents and they make decisions. There's no notion of probabilities, no notion of functions in that sense, right? It's just sets and these agents, right? With some kind of decision-making interpretation. And they define causality in a consistent way in that framework, which can still do it, or at, at, at least, you know, some of the key things that we can do with Perlian causality, right? So yeah, absolutely possible, super interesting. My bigger question is now, are you doing this because of the pure mathematical sense? Because I don't know, you think it's beautiful or whatever, or what would be your key motivation? Because I felt like you were just picked up mostly on the probability part because you know we have to estimate stuff and you feel like you might be able to get to conclusions quicker or, or more. Um, with a much greater generalization potential. So, the real world, or when I go ahead and try to make conclusions in the world as an intelligent agent, uh, try to conclude anything. I use my real world knowledge that I have, I check for applicability, and then I try to see, okay, I have these principles that I now apply in this situation. I have my setup, which is, um, for example, my notes on some level, like I'm some I'm somewhere in my in my work mode. I'm some on some some level. Um, I have my different input nodes, and I use my real world knowledge, which crystallizes as some properties that I see as relevant in this setting. And only from the state of my input and my uh, my properties, I try to derive the state t plus one, the next situation or the thing that I care about. Okay, so 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 far as I see it, I, I have two thoughts. One would just be, okay, again, this is just Perl's causality with time series now, no stochasticity. Uh, obviously, that's the whole point. Like, how do we get, you know, these mechanisms and so on? But if I know them, I know what's going to be the next state, it's, it's, and it's generalizable, and there's no questions about it. What I found more interesting now in what you were saying, 
was what about some kind of constraints, logical constraints, or however you want to formalize your physical constraints or whatever it is, right? We are talking about some principles, some principles, principles as constraints to improve learning, to improve, uh, you know, the reasoning that I do in, in my SCM or whatnot, right? And now thinking about related to work in nature, yes, for example, the typing assumptions for discovery, they are, I think, very similar in nature. You have some additional assumptions and then, you know, like you can get better results. But specifically now, say, let's say logic constraints, physical, say physical properties described in say first order logic and then, you know, uh, put somehow into a causal model. I don't recall any of these works. Does not mean that they does not exist, of course. Yeah. Um, I, I would find that super interesting. Super interesting. So if you want to do master thesis on this, yeah, we can, we can do this. <laughs> yeah. No. Very interesting. Because there I also see great value because, you know, you, it would be like inductive biases in machine learning, right? Like you use a CNN instead of fully connected network because of parameter sharing and stuff like that for images, yeah? Where the, it's natural fit for the representation. And so it's exactly this kind of thing, yeah? Yeah. yeah, yeah. What are the other thinking here? I'm thinking anything at all. I'm thinking about Christmas, I don't know, New Year. I mean, you came here, so I know you're hardcore. You're thinking actually about these things, and you care about it. So, uh, yeah, just just anything. Yeah. Do you think anything is stupid? Would you have done any formalism that we have seen so far differently? Stuff like that. Yeah? What bothers you maybe most? So. Everyone has that, no? I mean, oftentimes we have it for the wrong reasons because we still haven't understood what it is, right? Um, but then again, sometimes we actually have it for good reasons. So. Maybe you have something. Yeah. If you ask him specifically about the time series, if you don't like the state T and the time difference state T and Ah, okay. So, so you, you, what you don't like is the fact that we have lags. So saying that, for example, I don't know, after one minute, I'm, I'm standing here and then, I don't know, I throw a ball, but because it takes time, it would be hitting you only 10 seconds later. But like, why do you don't, don't like this, right? Because the thing I was describing right now was exactly why we do this, right? Yeah, but I, I'm missing like, um, should we are only looking at each slide, right? We, uh, and then we have this, this um, that's the connection between state n and state t n plus five. Mm -hmm. And we are in the intermediate states. We do not acknowledge about it. So, oh, so, so what you would argue in my example is somehow that yeah. the ball hitting you only coming from the ball being one position earlier before and not from me throwing it that. No, no, the problem is that. It, it this direct influence going over the. So, so what you want, you, you just want to see influences going via other time steps before that. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Okay, can we, can we as a group think of an example? So, so time steps, let's like think of them, say T and T plus five. Yes. Let's say plus one is 10 seconds. So it could be, you know, like then T plus five would be 50 seconds later. Yes. But you're saying that there is something 50 seconds earlier, which is directly influencing the thing 50 seconds later. Now I, 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 I think I start to see what you're, yes. what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, I think from a modeling perspective, how people would justify is saying that, you know, resolution and stuff like that, right? You can never, you can always go more fine grained, right? And stuff like that. I think that's what people would argue, but I agree with you. It's not so satisfying. So, so what's the. Mm. But what if I have, like, I'm saying just a stupid example, I have a button which is programmed to exactly after 50 seconds make the light turn on. Then me pressing that in that moment is the actual cause, no? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree, I agree. Um, 
Okay, so so would that still mean so so what would mean what would it mean if we remove that error, right? So if you're saying okay, it's not a cause anymore. Not, not remove it, just like be oh, but but see, isn't isn't that a question of abstraction then? Because right, like if I have like the two nodes, fifty seconds later the the thing and 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 when I press the button, right? And now you say, but you know, there's fifty nine seconds there's and it knows now it's in a state and one second it's going to trigger, right? But that's just included in the error, right? So that's just, I think it, it works out perfectly because it's just part of the abstraction, right? Like you can introduce new nodes in between now, or you can ignore them and just treat it as I press the button and it triggered it, right? You can ignore that. It's part of the structural yeah. equation, right? Like the structural equation changes, right? Yeah. It's not the same anymore. It's gonna include the fact that, you know, there is this node initially, right? It's just like, if you say treatment, for example, I'm giving you a drug and you have a headache, right? And you're now measuring whether the headache goes away. But the treatment is going to do something else. It's going to reduce, you know, blood levels, which is going to, you know, turn some kind of mitochondria do some certain things, right, and stuff like that, right? It's all in a structural equation, and it's reasonable to say it's the cause. It's just a level, different level of abstraction, right? So I think that would be the answer to 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 this point. Okay. Yeah. And it seems you are convinced, so so I think yeah, that's yeah. nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it's really just abstraction. Yeah. But it's a great point. Exactly these kind of things we have to ask ourselves, right? It gives us a better understanding and, and, and also where we have to go, yeah? What about, yeah? yeah. I just, just say, just say, don't like, I don't see you, don't. No, right? Let's process. For example, if we take this, uh, if we if we take this uh, this example exactly, we can go ahead and model our system as a Markovian process where each state only depends on the previous one. In which case, we have to track the internal state of the different components. Or alternatively, I would imagine we could go ahead and just um, reduce the complexity of our system, but say that everything depends on like uh, the state of that time. Time steps before, um, in which case we basically move all the complexity of modeling the internals of our system into a more complicated probability distribution that depends just on more stuff and is probably also more complex. Than Isn't that just abstraction, or, or what do you yeah. do? Huh? Um, is this like is this like a good trail to do? Uh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, so, so the trade off maybe of abstraction in general. So, we won't cover abstraction, I guess, here in this lecture. Yeah, but you can always talk to me separately on, on this topic. Yeah, but you know, there's also only not so many works on this, right? But in general, what they try to, to find is really the exact conditions, right? If I had this SCM and if I had this SCM, one is going to have more variables because it's kind of more detailed, right? Um, but like, how do I still map them exactly, right? How can I maybe also map them approximate, right? And in any case, even if you go for the exact thing, why do you care about some others? As I said, maybe at the beginning of this lecture, it's this thing that, mm, say I'm a kid, right? And there's like, I, I like to, because we have a similar example in our paper, right? Like say there's a row of dominoes, right? And if I push the first domino, it's a chain, right? The last one is gonna fall eventually, yeah? Now, what I can do is I can model this in a physics simulator, a causal model, which is really exact, like the contact forces, the this and that, it knows everything, yeah? But then me as a kid, yeah? I just care about if I stumble the first one, will the last one fall, right? That, that's my truth. So in my head, I'm really just modeling the last one, maybe the first one, right? But still, I want to have it exactly, you know, be faithful to the true model, right? So here, I'm willing to make the trade-off because... I just care about, you know, the simple model, right? For whatever reason, because maybe as a human, I have just this bias, like an outcome, outcomes race or something. I just care about simple stuff, or maybe I just care about this high level goal of like, will the last one fall? But if I have a physics simulator, I'm maybe someone who's interested in, you know, knowing exactly how dominoes behave specifically, right? Like my goal is a different one. It can be, you know, measured in say uh, um, complexity, right? Like how long does it take for my inference to, to actually be done, right? The, the bigger model, obviously, it's going to be the same one as a small model, but it's going to uh, take longer to give me an answer, right? Because it has to do more evaluations, computation, stuff like that, right? Um, yeah, so I think, like in the, in the general setting, 
um, I trade off more states, so more than each domain or individually, with um, the size of the stuff that I have to consider. So in the example with the kit, for example, Mm, no, now, it's it's not actually. It's not actually. Can be true for some examples, but for example, for the domino, you know if it's a chain, right? And assuming you know that they are aligned well and stuff like that, I just know if I push them over the first, I can already say the last one is gonna fall. Exactly. Right. So I don't have to do this intermediate computation of yes. first one kicks off second, second and third. So there's no size difference. So you actually lose something, right? But you are willing to lose that because as a kid you don't care about this thing that you're losing, right? But can our model uh, reproduce this simplification? Uh, yeah, for example, so this was actually our work, which we okay. presented in the ribs, where, where what we did was you lose this aspect, but you're willing to lose them, but you can still reason about what would have had happened if, for example, the middle one was fixed, someone held it, right? Like interventions, which we care about in causality, right? That's exactly the thing. But again, this is like <laughs> very cutting edge uh, stuff, yeah? So. So, so not many many people have thought about this, and and still not many people do. <laughs> so, so yeah, but it was one project that we have did. We did, and I think because both Moritz and I were super interested in this. Um, yeah, maybe one question I had coming up to my mind, so ask you as well. So, we have seen also, for example, in lecture seven, some of these different frameworks, right? Like we have, I mean, focused mostly on Perl, and usually people have a bias of of liking the thing they understand the most and stuff like that, but any framework you you preferred or anything that you found very interesting regarding you know the different ways of thinking about causality would you have a different definition of causality what was your causality i know i asked difficult questions there's no answers there's just opinions yeah. i think Yeah. While while I would agree, um, then again, what I find interesting, so I didn't discuss too much, but I was talking to Ricard at the Nerips, and then he does both frameworks, right? Um, and he also works with 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 uh, medical doctors, and it seems that they prefer the potential outcome stuff. Yeah, the potential outcomes is also grounded historically in, in medical terms, right? So maybe people are also trained in there. Maybe it's biases, maybe it's a sample. So there's many, you know, it's difficult to do the causal inference here. Yeah? But just if we, you know, go after after our nose, right? Like we follow the the, the, the track, right? Um, I find, find, find that bit, you know, counterintuitive because I always thought, you know, graphical representations are exactly the thing you want to show, right? I think the argument that he was making was, that you know the assumptions you can make them very clear, right? And you're just talking about like, okay, this is the outcome if you gave someone a treatment, right? And, and stuff like that. So I didn't have much discussion there, but it seems that maybe it's not as easy as we think. That it's just like, but then again, maybe it's just the, the different people. Yeah? I, I personally would agree with you. I, I actually like this framework a lot. I feel like it's it's just giving me additionally the graphs, right? Like whatever you wanna wanna call it. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's too hard. So I mean, most people here are trained in computer science. Yeah. Mm, yeah. What about actual causation? What did what did you think of that? Right. I mean, you have this big difference of like type causation. We are talking about like, uh, you know, car accidents cause deaths. Yeah. Uh, instead of you know like uh, me as a specific driver, if you know, I don't know if I'm super skilled or whatever. I'm like a Vin Diesel from Fast and Furious, right? Like, I might not you know crash or something. Uh, because of plot armor or something, yeah. Then, um, yeah. What what did you think of of this? Right. I mean, it's a very different way of thinking of of causality. Right. It has a lot of similarities, but the other one is a lot more conceptual still. Or 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 maybe asked differently even about all of these things that you have learned now. Right. I know when I was a student, unfortunately, there was no course like this. Right. So I'm more so even happy and excited that you know you are now the first here at TU Darmstadt who have this kind of course. Right. And I've had some feedback, you know, people saying like, hey, why have we not done this before, right? Like, because it seems that everyone converges somehow to this opinion that, well, deep learning, everything is nice, but somehow it's still stupid, right? Like everyone who's not in AI thinks like, oh man, this is this is crazy, robots, killer and stuff like that. And yeah, having these discussions is important. But then again, 
people who end up in this community, I feel most of the time are like, yeah, but it's just, you know, nearest neighbor essentially and stuff like that, right? So after seeing all these things, not right now. I, are you are you on this track? Do you think, okay, we should push this, we have to go with this? And 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 if so, like what of the things do you find most interesting or exciting, right? Or or what which things are maybe underwhelming actually after having learned about them? So please give me some thoughts. I I, I want to know how you think because I'm not in the position like you that I'm learning this for the first time, I guess, and, and also not with your background. So I'm super interested in these stuff. Okay, so here I can already counter that we have meaningful results. Maybe maybe not something like in the in the sense that you know we have solved personalized personalized medicine or something, right? Like because otherwise you would be aware of this, yeah. But for example, you know, one of these workshops I attended earlier this year is this French group, right? Um, and they work also with clinicians, right? And they did cause discovery on a bit larger scale, yeah. But not too crazy. So some I don't know hundreds of variables or whatever, right? But it was really nice the results that they showed and they really could find out new stuff, right? Which is the whole point, new scientific discovery. So the doctors were looking at this. Some things were, you know, consistent. Other things were new and surprising, right? And made people look further into it, right? It's like an AI-assisted science. Yeah? It's AI for, for scientific discovery, essentially. Yeah? So we definitely have these results. And then again, I can also tell because of the fast-moving CRL, but also because of fast-moving, you know, structural learning that... You know, for example, things like Notius, which have used and worked well in practice. There was this follow-up Dagma, and suddenly, you know, they jumped in complexity, and and now they could do a lot bigger graphs, right, with the same performance. Yeah, they have other issues, you know, the 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 synthetic DAC thing, versatility and stuff. But um, yeah, so so there is stuff happening there, right? It's obviously not there yet. I mean, we need smart people like you and, and the others here, yeah? I guess, to to figure this out, right? Like, how how can we push this even further? But I would answer in the affirmative. So far, we definitely have had some success, right? Um, otherwise, I think people would have dropped this a lot earlier already, yeah? uh, independent of the fact that conceptually it makes a lot of sense, of course, right? But so, okay, so so your thoughts are really, you you care about scaling this and, and things like that. And in this, I, I, I see and I agree. And I think, you know, most people who have also, you know, like a practical mind or taste, uh, I think they are all, all on board with this. I think that's a it's a it's a majority opinion. So, but yeah, anything else you have? Like, oh man, this was very cool. This was underwhelming. This is we should push into this. So, for example, one thing just to give a personal example: when I first read Book of Wine stuff like that, I was like, oh my god, these counterfactuals. This is crazy, right? Like, not just because Pearl was using Einstein, who was thinking of the atom and the laptops and skyscrapers, right? Um, visually, it was very nice, you know, metaphorically, yeah. But because of the fact that it's really like. It resonated with a lot of thoughts I do myself privately, right? Like my bike got stolen and oh, what would I have I done, right? And and the fact that you somehow can go into the past and, and retrospect. Like this, you know, think, think like this, what was it? The, the Lorenz quote? Like thinking is, uh, imagining is, is is thinking in a, in a latent space or something. I don't know. There's this very famous quote. Uh, I would have to look it up, which was used by Bernard Schulkopf also in his talk, talks, right? And that's essentially counterfactuals. So I was hooked on counterfactuals from the start, right? I, I've not done much work in counterfactuals myself yet, but I was, you know, like just on a, on a conceptual level. Wow, this is amazing. Yeah. So anything like this. I see, Lucas, you were just uh, thinking. Uh, I feel like uh, communism has uh, certain partners so caring for totality. On the other hand, I was always felt that like for every method we learn, there are like four slides of assumption we have to make. <laughs> the whole way it seems to be questioning like how realistic is this result that we have to I agree, and that's also a big part, you know, again, like going back to the Lucatello discussion at the at the workshop, you know, like especially if it gets out of hand, in a sense, people make kind of let's say stupid assumptions just to prove a point, right? Like Sure, if if I don't I don't understand that there's 
I don't know, uh, flying unicorns and stuff like that, then I can come to maybe any kind of wild conclusion following that, right? And that's what you want to avoid, yeah? But then again, think about it. That's exactly the achievement, right? Because in deep learning or whatever, you are making assumptions as well. It's just that you are implicit about them. You don't think even about them, right? You might not even be aware about them. That's the worst part, right? And then, you know, you have these fallacies, like you try to generalize, you try to apply it somewhere where, you know, it would not work. And because you didn't even think about the assumptions, you're like, oh, what is going on, right? Like, I don't know, maybe things like even the drocking phenomenon, right? Like people observe weird behavior where, you know, like in reinforcement learning policy works, it learns the behavior, and then it just keeps on training, and then suddenly it loses it, and it cannot recover ever, right? Like, Stuff like that, right? And then, you know, it's, I guess, I mean, it's essentially, as long as everything is correctly implemented, it's due to some flaws in, in the way it's set up, right? And yeah, it's, it's implicit assumptions, essentially, right? And and, and you, you're not being aware of them. So I think that's the ultimate achievement of causality and also how Pearl would put it and why Pearl would think that the reasoning uh, and inference part is more important than the discovery part, because you say, okay, I have this, can you guarantee me now sound conclusions? Something which is fixed, which is true, which is absolutely true, right? Of course, then the assumptions, right? But at least we, you know, we shouldn't, this should be the standard paradigm for science, I guess. You know, making your assumptions explicit, right? Like, I assume this, I assume this, and I'll conclu conclude, right? I agree, especially coming from maybe machine learning. Say, you know, you don't want to make many assumptions because it feels restrictive. You also feel stupid, maybe, you know, making all these different assumptions and thinking like, oh, actually, now I, I, I already ass assumed the solution, right? Like, I agree with that sentiment, right? And especially, I think people coming from machine learning and computer science are affected by this. But um, I would say it's a good thing, right? Like, that, that we have to rethink in that way, right? It's just, yeah, I, I, I share the sentiment. It's like, uh, you want to have minimal assumptions, of course. Uh, uh. It's a rude awakening in a sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is super interesting. So when you saw the balls example with the actual causation, right? This is actually taken from um, I mean, these examples, Toby Gaston back at Stanford is using a lot. He's a cognitive science who specializes in causality, right? And so what he does is he tries to understand the human using causal models. And he uses Perl, Halper, and whatever, right? And for example, he would have, you know, the hypothesis that humans use counterfactuals. Then he builds a counterfactual model, which works well with these, these balls. He aligns them, and he sees that his models predicts well the human. And then he essentially, you know, measures some statistics, blah, 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 and concludes, hey, yeah, the humans do actually seem to use counterfactuals and they might actually be very much so like the, the ones that, for example, Pearl proposed. And that's why actually Pearl also has some support from cognitive science. Say, yeah? So yeah, you have exciting works there and, and super important. It's again, cognitive science, again, trying to understand intelligence and whatnot, but on the human level, right? And and they use then causal models to, to, to you know, um, yeah, see, see whether that's the way how humans might, might actually do things. And, and yeah, we have some amazing results. And he is a great presenter, so he can convey the ideas and he has nice visualizations. So any talk you can find by him, it's going to be a fun talk, right? So a guest in back, Toby guest in back, yeah, in Stanford. Cool. I think we are, I mean, five minutes more than maybe if anyone had anything else, right, just, just say it, right? But maybe the, the final thing, we are just jumping to yeah, the next uh, dates that we have, right? So 2024 is coming up next. And we are really just going to have four more sessions, which are going to introduce new stuff, new content. And it's part of part two, right? Where, you know, we are talking about more recent work, right? So we are going to talk a little bit about metrics, you know, things like structural intervention distance. If you have two graphs and, you know, some information about the interventional distributions, how can we, you know, differentiate or how can we quantify it consistently? explanations right maybe i'm also going to talk about some works that we have done but in general just causality and explanations they seem to be related a lot right when we ask for an explanation we ask for the reason why right we ask for the root cause maybe right it's not the same thing exactly because explanation also has this dimension of you know like uh, a communication and so on however there's a big overlap right and so we're going to discuss this a little bit then in the penultimate session we're going to have you know neural models or in general, just, you know, how have people done models, right? Actual models. 
Um, and then finally, in the last uh, new content session, we are just going to talk about large scale, about LLMs and the more recent craze. Yeah? Then the really final date that we have together is just going to be some Q&A before exam. So I guess we are going to do it in a very similar style like today. Just recap maybe not on the part one, but just part, part two parts that we're going to have by, by then. And then, you know, I mean, you can be pretty sure that we are not going to have the exam by that time. Yeah. However, you know, we have some ideas of what we're going to put there and we're not going to go too crazy. Right. So, so obviously just with what we have learned here, but you know, maybe we can hint at some things that, you know, we certainly think will not be part of it or whatever. Right. So I guess that's always interesting for students. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, on Florian's birthday, we are having the, the exam. Yeah. Um, so, so if you congratulate Florian, you get extra points. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, so we are, exactly, exactly. I know I am aware I've been from the very beginning, um, they couldn't unfortunately do some, some other things. And even the, because they computer vision do it so long, right. I was even offering of, okay, we just do 60 minutes, 90 minutes, whatever. Right. And no, it's, it's not possible, unfortunately. However, um, there is, if it's a rare case or something, re, you know, orals and stuff like that are an option, but that's really just a really exception if, if nothing else works. Um, uh, other than that, it's just uh, rewriting at, at some later point. Uh, I would have to check. I don't know whether the officials, they sent me a response on that one, right? But then again, it's not even that important because it would anyhow be not in March anymore, right? So some months later, I think actually only in the next uh uh, semester then right which is always unfortunate but uh yeah but yeah no worries we can figure out right like whatever it is so, say you know the situation say you're you're concluding your masters right and this is the only last thing or so then of course we're going to try to figure out how to do this with an oral or something like this right but yeah yeah and and this is really it um again some xkcd here we have the true meaning of christmas starting from the left Hey, you're looking festive. Oh, yeah, I love Christmas. Really? Doesn't seem like a kind of thing. It's our most meta holiday. Okay, well, what is he talking about? How so? All our Christmas stories now about it, discovering the true meaning of Christmas. Huh? Yeah. And then sharing it with others. At some point, that quest itself became the true meaning. Oh, so you mean like a word whose definition is the act of looking up the definition of this word? Auto meta logolex. Oh, my least favorite of Santa's reindeer. Yeah. So, and with that, I wish you a happy Christmas and uh, thanks for stopping by. And yeah, it was a fun session. It's